Hi, I'm here today to read you a book. The book called is called America is Her Name by Luis Rodriguez. Let me see. It is not enough to prepare our children for the world. We must also prepare the world for our children. America is her name. And this must be a picture of America. A Mixteca Indian girl walks through the Pilsen Barrio in Chicago. She has honey brown skin and elongated eyes that are large and dark. Her thick hair is in braids. She was born in the mountains of Otsaka. She still remembers the goats, pigs, and thatch roofed house they once called home. Now she is in a strange place she can't even pronounce. She dreams of Osaka in Spanish. America is her name. America Solis. She is nine years old and has two brothers and a sister. Her mother's name is Nayeli, a mistico name which means flower of the fields. America's father, Oscar, works the factories of Southwest Chicago. He sleeps all day and works all night. She rarely sees him. Her uncle, Tia Filmon, lives with them. He also works and he drinks. America dreams that he doesn't drink. So there's America. Those must be the animals that um, she lives with at her home. On her way to school, America smiles at the man from the guero, from the guero who sells helados, real fruit ice cream sticks. She waves at the barber from Michoacan standing outside his shop waiting for customers. She sees teenagers standing around with nothing to do. She smiles at them. They smile back and continue talking. So these must be the teenagers. Here's the man selling helados, and here she is walking. She has a bird on her shoulder. Rounding the next corner, she sees a boy walking down the street. Some guys call out to him. He spins around, pulls a gun out of his waistband, and shoots at the group. The others run, but America just stands there. Nobody is hit. She stares at the young man who then turns toward her. His face is a scowl, his eyes cold and dark. He puts the gun back into his waistband and walks away. So here is the man with the gun shooting at these boys. And America drops everything because she sees it happening, right? When America reaches her English as a second language class, she slips quietly into the room as Miss Gable is yelling at the students. Sit down, be quiet. America sits at the back of the room and says nothing. America used to talk all the time. In her village, she greeted the animals in Spanish mixed with a few Mixteco words. She sang in the morning. She recited the many poems taught her since she was a baby. She had a voice, strong, open, and free. Somehow in Chicago, she has lost the voice. She thinks hard about her faraway home that is beginning to fade from her memory. Yesterday, as she passed Miss Gable and Miss Williams in the hallway, she heard Miss Gable's whisper, she's an illegal. How can that be? How can anyone be illegal? She is Mixteco, an ancient tribe that was here before the Spanish, the Spanish, before the blue-eyed, even before this government that now calls her illegal. How, how can a girl called America, 
not belong in America. And so here is America thinking about her home and she's in her English class. But today something in school is different. Miss Gable is, introduces Mr. Oponte, a Puerto Rican poet who is visiting. Miss Gable tells him they are a difficult class. Mr. Oponte looks at everyone and then asks in Spanish, who likes poetry? Many hands start up. Who wants to recite some poetry, he asks. America quickly raises her hand high. Mr. Aponte asks her to stand and recite a poem. America closes her eyes and rocks with the rhythms of the Spanish words she recites. When she finishes, the class explodes in applause. Mr. Aponte is pleased. Miss Gable just frowns. So there's America. And she looks like she's reciting her poem. She's saying her poem to the class. Okay, she has her bird on her shoulder. There's poetry and everyone, Mr. Aponte tells the class. When you use words to share feelings with someone, somebody else, you are a poet. And po poets belong to this, the whole world. Never forget this. He tells them about the great Spanish language poets such as Julia de Bar Borgos, Pablo Neruda, Federico Garcia Lorca, and Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. Then he asked the whole class to write about their lives, their memories, and their feelings. Some of the children can't write very well. Mr. Aponte says, this is okay. Don't worry about spelling or grammar. That will come later. Write in Spanish or English, whichever feels comfortable. America starts writing. She has so much to write about. She stops or she thinks she won't be able to stop. So there she is. There's Mr. Aponte. There's the class and they're writing their poems. When America gets home, she hears her dad yelling. He has been laid off from the factory. The family gathers for supper around a wooden table in the small kitchen. Her mother tells her father angrily, I was called a wetback at the market today. No matter what we do, we don't belong. Tio Philemon comes into the room drunk and loud. Never say you don't belong, he says. We belong anywhere and everywhere. Once you believe you don't belong, you'll be homeless forever. Maybe we'll go back to Osaka. Maybe we want, won't. For now, this is home. After supper, supper, as America sits at the kitchen table to write, her dad walks by. What are you doing, Mija? He asks. I'm writing, she says. Writing? Is this for school? No, Poppy. It's for me. I'm writing a poem for me. Don't waste your time. Where are you going to go with learn writing? Learn to clean house, to take care of your brothers and sisters. Writing for yourself won't pay the bills. So there's a medica. There's her puppy. He has money. There's fruit on the table. And she's writing. But her dad doesn't want her to write. He says, writing is no money. There's no money. America is sad. Will this be my life, she wonders? Not to write, to clean houses, get married, have children. To wait for the factory to feed us. She sees her in her mind all of the sullen faces that looked at, look out of third floor windows when she walks to school and the desperate men without jobs standing on street corners. They all seem trapped, like flowers in a vase, full of song and color, yet stuck in a gray world where they can't find a way out. Will this be my life? So here's America looking out at the window. She sees people outside, the men who have no jobs, the hopscotch here, but no one's playing. 
the women over here. Mr. Aponte stopped coming to America's class. He was only there as a part as part of a special program. Miss Gable is yelling at everyone for talking out of turn, for not doing their work right. America wishes Mr. Aponte was back. She writes her stories and poems secretly now because there's no one to read them to. At home, everyone is worried. There are days when the family doesn't have enough money for food. Tio Filimon works, but mainly to help with the rent and buy beer. Her father paces the rooms and hallways, always angry. America is quiet and sad. Nayeli sits down at the table with America and says, Mija, write something for me. America gives her a pencil and a piece of paper and says, Mama, you write something too. Every day after school, Nayeli and America sit at around the table and write. Nayeli writes about long gone days in the ranch and in, in the rancho, about the tall grasses and burly oxen, about her many cousins and other family who always visit did. America smiles at her mother's struggles with the words. They share their stories with each other. Soon, America's older brother is taking part and even the little ones join in. So there's America and her mother writing their stories. Tia Filimon reads one of America's stories and tells her it is very good. Her dad comes in and says, you're still writing? What did I tell you about this? Tia Filimon looks at him hard and says, yes, she is very good. You got quite a daughter here. Oh, what do you know? You can't even write, America's father responds. Yes, that's true. All I can do is work with my hands and gulp a few beers, Tia Filimon says, but your daughter is going to do more than you or me. I can see it. She will bloom long after we've rotted on the vine. Okay, so there's America and there's Teofil Limon. He's reading her poem and he really likes it. And I don't know if you can tell, but he's crying. He has little tears coming down his eyes. And this must be her little brother, one of the little babies. A few days later, America burst in the kitchen. Mama, mom, mama, tengo un, un sin. Un sh, tengo un sin. She says, tengo un sin, yeah. She says, I got a hundred on cien. That's a cien. Tengo un cien, she says. I got a hundred on my writing assignment. Even Miss Gable liked it, Nayeli beams proudly. I knew you could do it. You are a poet. Her dad looks up from the television and says, well, what do you know? Maybe I've got a poet for a daughter. He stands up. America thinks he's going to yell at her. Instead, he hugs her really tight. Miha, he says, don't worry. I'll find a job again. I'll work hard every day, every night if I have to. It's good you're writing poetry. America smiles. Tio Filimon winks at her and says, you'll be a real poet. A real poet. That, good, that sounds good to Miss Becca girl, who some people say doesn't belong here. A poet. America knows belongs everywhere. And so here she is with her family. And they're hugging her. And they're all happy because she got 100 on her poem. Un cien on her poem. And here she is. And she knows that she's going to have a future because she says a poet belongs everywhere and she will have a place in this world as a poet. So this is the end of our book. The end, here's the bird.